inside my head Tell me am I worth it I remember you said Do you even see me? Go find someone else instead Tell me am I worth it? Welcome to King of the Hill. Anybody stoked for tonight? Yeah. Dude, what a, what a night it's been so far. Isn't anyone excited to have a God that, that hears us, to have a God that sees us, a, a God that, that loves us so much? I, I know I am. And if you don't know about God and Jesus, you're going to know about him tonight. <laughs> so we're stoked for tonight. I just want to take a second to welcome you guys to Spectrum. Thursday nights are family night. Amen. Amen. Love you guys so, so much. As we get into King of the Hill, it's a series that's all about the victory of the cross and the resurrection, life from death, beauty from ashes, and it's all about this, this God and how he sent his son to die on the cross for us, but to not just die, but to rise again so that we could have purpose. And life. And so we're super excited that you guys came. It's going to be an absolutely amazing semester. And I, I want to just start by to, just sharing this. I felt so strongly about tonight and just that some of you are here tonight and you, you need to hear this. You need to hear this, that, that one of God's names is El Roy. And what that means is he's the God who sees you. He's the God who sees you. And maybe you feel like you're, you're a reject. Maybe you feel isolated. Maybe you feel like you're not good enough. Maybe you're being bullied currently. Maybe you just had a rough day at school. I want you to know that God sees you. And that he, see, he sees you. He sees the real you. Not the you that you try and put out, that you fabricate, that you want people to be impressed with. He sees you. And so tonight as we dig into the word, you need to know that he loves you so much. And though life may be hard right now, there's purpose in everything. And everything will be okay. Turn to somebody real quick and say, it's going to be okay. I've titled this message tonight, Faith Through Famine. Faith Through Famine. And we're going to be looking, if you have a Bible you can check it out. It's Genesis 22, verses 1 through 18. We're going to have it up on the screens for you if you didn't bring a Bible. But there once was a man who had faith to be obedient. And he had such a trust for God that even through the hardest and driest parts of his life, he, he was a man who received a promise. And although that promise took 25 years 
to come true. He still trusted God and was still obedient no matter how long the wait. He was tested and tested but had faith through famine. And this man, his name's Abraham. I want to just give you guys a quick backstory before we dive in. Abraham, at the time that we meet him in the Bible, he's 75 years old. 75 years old. His wife named Sarah is 65 years old. And God had given Abraham a promise and Sarah saying that I'm going to give you a son. And in that culture, it was, it was a bummer if you didn't have a child. And so they have no children and they're old. And God says, you're going to have a son. But it took 25 years to have that son. The son would be named Isaac. He's the promised son. And so at the time that we pick up this story, Abraham is well over 100. Sarah is about 100 as well. But at the time that Isaac was born, Sarah was 90 and Abraham was 100. It's crazy. Have you guys ever met those people that, that have parents that kind of look like, no offense, but they look really old, right? And you're like, are you the grandparent or the great-grandparent or, or the parent, right? I learned this the hard way. I was at like a graduation party and I had a friend. I hadn't met her, her like family yet. So she's standing there, you know, well, let's name her Debbie, okay? So Debbie's there. And uh, there's, like, this older gentleman that she goes, and she gives, like, a hug and, and a, like, kiss on the cheek, too. So I'm like, oh, like, he must, like, be related to her, but he looks kind of old. So I go to her. I'm like, sir. I'll pull out, right? I'm like, sir, ple pleasure to meet you. My name's Cody. You must be her grandfather. <laughs> and he, in my smile like this, I'm like, yeah. It quickly turns to, like, fear. He's like, boy, I'm her father. I ought to smack you, silly. I'm like, oh, my bad. You're the dad, not the grandpa. Why did you wait so long to have kids? I don't know. I don't know. But Sarah, no, no, no shade. But Sarah and Abraham, they're old. And they have this baby. And they're, they're super, super, you know, old. And they've been waiting for this plan and this promise. But finally, the promise comes. And so here we are in verse 1 of chapter 22. Let, let's go ahead and read it. We'll throw it up on the screen. It says, sometime later... And that meaning after the baby was born and he had grown up a little bit. It says, sometime later, God tested Abraham. How's that for a start? God tested Abraham. Abraham, God said. Here I am, he replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. And real quick, it's interesting because Abraham had, in fact, two sons. But here it says, only son. But you need to know that Abraham's other son, his name was Ishmael, and he was a product of the flesh of them not wanting to wait for the promise. And so he's still Abraham's son. But here God is referring to Isaac as the only son, the promised son. So he says, take Isaac, go up to the land of Moriah, the region of Moriah. And he says, sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain, I will show you. Verse 3, early the next morning, Abraham got up and loaded his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked and saw the place in a distance. He said to his servants, stay here with the donkey while I go with the boy as we go up over here. We will worship and then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac, and he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father, Abraham, Father, yes, my son, Abraham replied. The fire and the wood are here, Isaac said, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham said, God himself will provide the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. When they reached the place God had told them about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. Let's go ahead and stop there. First thing you guys can write down is preparation to faith. Preparation to faith. And before we continue, let's pray. Word, word. God, we come before you. We thank you so much for this night. Thank you for this series. Thank you for my friends. Thank you for the freedom that is found here. Thank you that your spirit is alive, that you are alive, Father, that you are with us. Pray you'd speak to us in mighty ways. In Jesus' name, amen. 
It's so hard to be obedient. Any amens in here? Amen. Amen. It's so hard to be obedient. Like every fiber in our bodies just wants to say no. Every ounce in us just wants to say no. When somebody asks you to, asks you to do something, our initial reaction is typically what? No. No, I don't want to clean the toilet. No, I don't want to ha pay half of the fee for a driver's ed. You're my parents. You owe it to me, right? No, I don't want to, like, stop eating candy and pizza for breakfast. It's, it's easier to say no. Everything in us wants to be disobedient. I don't know why this is, but there's just something in us that automatically wants to say no. And this morning, for example, I'm changing Berkeley's diaper. And Berkeley's like, I'm a big kid now, right? Like, she's a big girl, dude. And like, she's a big girl, so she eats, like, a lot and drinks a lot, which means that her diapers are, like, right? <laughs> Pray for me. <laughs> and so I'm changing Berkeley's diaper this morning. It's kind of our morning routine. If I, I mean, I have to. I'm her dad. Like, if I don't, then never mind. Okay. <laughs> so I'm changing her diaper, you know, and I'm trying to put her pink Paw Patrol pants back on, right? They're really cute. They got, like, a little paw prints all over them. If you don't, don't know what Paw Patrol is, just Google it. It's like this little cartoon. Anyways, trying to put her pants back on, and she's like fighting me, and I don't know what it is about babies, but they're so strong. They're so strong. Like, I'm trying to put her pants back on, and she's like 40 pounds of just meat, and she has no self-control, so it's all or nothing with her. And you all need to pray for her, because she can be so sweet, but so sinful. She says, either I'm going to kiss you or I'm going to kill you, fool. Watch out. <laughs> and so I'm trying to put her really cute pink Paw Patrol pants back on. And uh, she does like, you know, I'm like right here. She does like this full crocodile like, whoosh, you know, I'm like, oh, my arm's like, oh, goodness. I'm like, fine, don't wear your pants. And she just looks at me. She's like, huh, okay. <laughs> it's like, oh, God. You know, I'm like trying to like discipline her. And so, you know, we, we do that. That's, that's one thing. That's crazy. So then the next thing, I'm like, okay, Berkeley, like, uh, I'm trying to, to teach you to be o obedient. Two things we're trying to teach you now are obedience and patience. And poor thing, you know, a little, little sweet baby Jesus infant bricks in. He's a saint. He's just staring at Berkeley like this. Because mom is putting this some magic milk, you know what I'm saying? Like, he's just, like, milk wasted all the time. And I'm like, son, that's not the example that you should follow. And he's just like, uh, and Berkeley's like, uh, like, rolling around. I'm like, okay, I'll give up. So I'm like, Berkeley, can you please put your baby wipes away, right? Obedience and patience. And so she just kind of looks at us and, no. And I, it would have literally taken her, like, five seconds but five seconds of disobedience led to 15 minutes of pain, right? I'm like, Burke, like, you need to do this. And she's saying no, and she's rolling around, and she's being disobedient. And so finally, I, we put her in timeout. We shut the door. Me and Chantel listen. And we just hear screaming, like, Rah! And I'm like, whoa, is she practicing for a metal band? Is there an exorcism? What's going on? And all of a sudden, we hear this, like, Rah! and then nothing. And I look at Chantel, I'm like, is it safe? <laughs> Should we call like 911? <laughs> so I open the door, you know, and Berkeley's just standing there like this. And I kid you not, her baby wipes are gone. Her toys are like clean on the side of the room. Like I've never seen, apart from us cleaning it, her room was as clean as I've never seen it before. And she's just standing there. I'm like, wow, Berk, good job. Like you finally listened, but we could have avoided all of this if you would have just obeyed. In the first place. See, what, what I'm getting at is that obedience is important. And also is time out. Like, if you guys are acting a fool, you better believe, man. I'll, I'll call your parents and say, hey, put them in time out. I'll say it faster than you can say the new Spectrum meme page is lit. Okay, watch out. <laughs> watch out. Watch out, y'all. Am I joking? I don't know. I'm a dad. I got dad jokes for days. I've made it. Praise God. Praise God. <laughs> But obedience is hard. But as Christians, obedience is crucial. No matter how old you are, if we're being honest, it's super hard to obey, especially through the hardest and driest times that we experience, especially through the famine in life. 
First thing is you've written down, if you haven't written it down yet, write it again. Preparation to faith. God starts by speaking to Abraham. He says, Abraham. And y'all, you write this down real quick. This is super important. Right? God says, Abraham. And if you want to marry, like, that Christian person, just say this. It'll work every time. Sup, Abraham. Try it. It'll work. Write it down. <laughs> That's how Chantel married me, so. <laughs> Great. Okay. So God says, hey, Abraham. And Abraham says, here I am. He says, yes, God, here I am. And we need to look at this for just a second. When God speaks to you, what is your posture? Is it receptive or is it defiant? When you're receptive, you're open to what God wants to do. And I have this feeling tonight, friend, that God wants to break down some walls in your life. That God wants to open your eyes. That he wants to show you real faith. And he wants you to not just hear about it, but to have it. So tonight, as we continue, let's commit to saying, God, here I am. Speak, your servant listens. I receive what you want to show me tonight. Verse 2. God tells him to take his only son, his son that he loves, Isaac, to go up to offer him as a, as a sacrifice. And we need to know, you must not forget this, friend. God has always had a plan. And the plan from the beginning of time was to rescue his people. And that includes you and me. See, when we pick up on this story, we're already thousands of years into the existence of mankind. Into the existence, the creation of man by God himself. And the plan has always been about Jesus. It always has been, it always will be about Jesus. In the Garden of Eden, where sin entered and infected the human race, God tells Satan that one is coming, that you will only be able to bruise his heel, but the one who is coming will crush your head, friend. It's always been about Jesus. There's 66 books, thousands of years, but one name and one name alone, the name of Jesus. There's a plan, and here God is using Abraham to be a part of that plan. In the beginning, as we read, God tested Abraham. Great. <laughs> Does that mean that God's going to test me too? Yeah, it does. You will be tested, but why? It's interesting that the word test means to be proven. To be proven by trial. To prove what needs to be proven, you may ask. Your faith. Your faith must be proven. See, when God tests us, his purpose is to prove that our faith is real, whether it's genuine or it's counterfeit. Growing up, I loved playing soccer, and in high school, one of my homies got me this Manchester United jersey. It was super cool. I wore it all the time, right? I had the badge, the colors, the sponsor. I was stoked. And then one day, I washed it in the washing machine because, I mean, if you wear a jersey every day, then it smells like hot booty, right? So I washed it. So I put it back on. It was my prized possession. I put it back on. I look in the mirror like, hey, Ronaldo, what's up, right? And then I look, and the Manchester United patch is gone. And I look, and I'm like, what is this? This is a different badge. I've had this for years. It is, it's what? It's funny. <laughs> now I laugh about it. I was pretty upset at the time. But now I laugh because somebody had bought something and patched it on top. So it was a counterfeit jersey. And you can only imagine how much it must have cost selling as an authentic. So here's what I'm getting at. I walked around with this jersey that looked real but wasn't. And a lot of you have counterfeit faith. A lot of you are walking around as a Christian who, who isn't genuine, who isn't real. And when I say real, it's like, oh, I'm a real human being. But friend, God wants to take you so much deeper. God wants to, to show you things. He wants your faith to be real, to be proven by trial, to be genuine. You need to know that God doesn't test us to prove to himself that our faith is real. God tests us to prove to ourselves that our faith is real. That our faith is real. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to be a counterfeit Christian. Anybody with me? 
I want to have a real relationship with God. So when the test comes, know that God is using it as preparation to faith. Abraham says, here I am, God, I'm listening. What is it that I should do? So God says to take your son, to sacrifice him on this mountain that I will show you. And so immediately after, it says early the next morning, Abraham got up and prepared for the trip. Imagine what's possibly going through his head. Wait, God, you promised me this son 25 plus years ago. He's here now. What you've promised to me, now you want to take away. Like, I don't know why he possibly could have thought that. Or perhaps what Abraham thought was God gives and God takes away. He's been faithful before, so he'll be faithful now. He's always come through. Why wouldn't he now? He prepares for what God is calling him to do regardless of how bad it hurts. So Abraham cuts the wood that he would lay across his son on that mountain to burn. He sharpens the knife that he would use to kill his son. He prepares the way to do what God asked him to do. Friend, take a moment to ask yourself, what has God asked me to sacrifice to him? What thing in my life has God asked me to offer up to him, that hobby that maybe has gotten a hold of you in a negative way? Maybe that toxic relationship? Maybe that addiction? Maybe that practice? And what's our response? Is it, yes, Lord, I'll do what you say, even though it hurts, even though it's so painful, I'm going to trust you all, prepare in faith, I'll do what you asked me to do. Or is it, God, you know, that sounds great, but uh, I'm, I'm pretty comfy where I'm at, so thanks, but no thanks. If you aren't willing to hurt for God, then you're not willing to be healed by God. If you're not willing to hurt for God, then you're not willing to be healed by God, friend. Don't you see that, that he wants to test you, to refine you, to purify you, to, to prove that your faith is real to yourself? He already knows if it's real or not. He already knows. The second thing you can write down is number two, pain of faith. Preparation to faith. Now number two, pain of faith. Abraham knew for three days that he was going to kill his son. He knew for three days that he was going to kill his son. Three long days of knowing the pain of faith. And you know, pain is a strange thing. Am I right? Pain's a strange thing. It's something we all hate but can't avoid. We hate pain so much that we don't want to let anybody into our lives. We hate pain so much that we don't want to get close to anyone, that, that we're afraid that if we let them in to see us, then they're just going to leave us. If we let them in, we're like, oh, like, you're just going to hurt me like my dad did. Or that my uncle or, or my, my friend or my boyfriend or girlfriend, if I let you in to see the real me, you're just going to leave me like everyone else. I know what rejection feels like. I know what it feels like, friend, but I'm here to tell you that God will never leave you. Amen. Will never leave you. He will never leave you. He loves you before you accepted him. He's going to love you even after you've accepted him. If he loves you in your mess and in your sinful behavior and nature, then you have to believe that he's going to love you despite your past, despite your shortcomings. That if he loved you then, he'll love you. Now, some of you don't even believe in God, but he still loves you. He still loves you. There is purpose in the pain. Never forget that. If I'm being honest as well, faith hurts. Faith hurts. Faith, if you don't know, is the complete confidence in someone or something. And it's especially hard as a Christian to put your whole life into the hands of a God that you just can't see with your eyes. Right? It's hard. But even though we can't physically see God, we can feel his presence. We can experience him. Why is my life different? 
Why am I not angry anymore? Why am I not addicted to that? Why do I feel excited? Why do I have joy? Why do I have purpose? It's because God's real and he cares about you. Yeah, come on. He loves you and he cares about you. You need to write that down, to memorize that he loves you and he cares about me. Where there is faith, there's pain. But where there's pain, there's purpose. Where there's faith, there's pain. Where there's pain, there's purpose. And without pain, your faith will never grow. Without pain, your faith will never grow. God is testing you to allow your faith to grow. But when the famine hits, when the dry times in life hits, what's our response going to be? Is it God is out to get me or God is out to grow me? Is it, man, God, God's pointing the finger at me. He hates me. Or is it God loves me so much to not leave me the way I am? He's out to grow me, to benefit me, not to hurt me. Not to hurt me. We can say, God, like, it's okay to be honest before God. Some of you need to know that it's okay to be honest. Like, God, this sucks. This hurts so bad, but I'm trusting you. If you came through before, then you'll come through again. Faith without pain will not grow. Though it may be dry, though it may be hard, though it may be hot and barren, friend, keep walking, keep serving, keep seeking, keep searching, keep praying. Because if God came through then, he'll come through now. There is faith through famine. It's faith through famine. Abraham knows he's going to kill his promised son. He knows it. And that's real. That's real pain. But he has faith that God is going to do something. He says in verse 5, stay here while the boy and I go over there. He says, we will worship. And then he says, and then we will come back to you. It's unusual for a, a, a dad to say who's about to kill his son, right? We're, we're going to go worship, and then we're going to come back. He's going to go sacrifice his son, and he says he's going to worship. He says, you know, God says his son's going to die, but he says we will come back. You need to know that sacrifice is worship. That sacrifice is worship, offering something up freely to God so that he will be glorified. Saying, God, I want to offer my life to you. I want to offer everything that I have to you, my talents, my, my past, my present, my future, everything. Consume me so that your plan and your purpose can be done in and through my life. If you notice earlier, it says that God told him to go up. And to offer his son as, as a, what, a burnt offering. For a burnt offering to happen in the Old Testament, a person would have to take an animal, would have to slit its throat, let the blood drain. They would then cut the animal in pieces. They would cut the hide and keep the hide. But they would put this animal onto a fire, and they would burn it. And the Bible says that, that the smoke would arise and go up to God, and it would be a sweet aroma, a sweet smell to God. See, a burnt offering was a request by the person who was sacrificing to be made right with God. It was saying, God, I need to be forgiven. See, before Jesus, this is the way of atonement. You would sacrifice. The, the Bible says in Hebrews that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. So a burnt offering means that the animal was completely consumed. And that they were offered up as a sweet smelling, as an ascending offering up into God. So can we offer God our lives as a burnt offering? Can we say, God, consume all of me. I give you all of me. I give you my pride, my anger, my jealousy, my, my, my good times, my bad times, my struggles, my addictions, my, my joy. Everything I give you, consume me so that you can call me. Consume me so you can call me. It may hurt, but you got to do it. It may be painful, but have the faith that Abraham had. He said, we will come back. He didn't say that to himself. He told it to two living humans that were there, two witnesses. He says, we will come back 
to you. We're going to go worship, sacrifice his worship, but we're coming back to you. He believed that either God on the top of that hill would provide a substitute sacrifice or that God would resurrect his son that he killed back to life. What faith? He says we will come back. Either God's going to provide or God's going to resurrect. It's one or the other, friend, and that's the same for us in our lives. God's going to provide or he's going to resurrect. God came through then. He'll come through now. Let's go all out in our faith. Let's give all of ourselves in faith that God is faithful to provide what we need and to bring us what he's promised to us, to us. And the pain doesn't stop there. Abraham takes the wood that he cut three days earlier and placed it on his son Isaac as they ascended the hill. Abraham carried the fire and the knife. As they walked, Isaac noticed that something was different about this journey. Daddy, he says, yes, my son, the fire and the wood are here, but where's the lamb for the offering? And I can just see the tears in Abraham's eyes as he says to his only begotten son, God himself, my son, will provide the lamb as the burnt offering, my son. And when they reached the place that God had told them, Abraham built an altar and arranged the wood that he would lay his son upon to burn. And I bet that it would have been easy for Abraham to want to take shortcuts or want to, to kill time. I bet it would have been easy to, to go slowly up the mountain, to, to maybe build the altar and drop the wood as to delay the inevitable. But he doesn't. He does what God asked him to, regardless of how much it hurt. Regardless of how much it hurts, see, Abraham loved his God more than he loved his son. He loved his God more than he loved his promised son. Abraham was trusting God and just sacrificing as he always did, being faithful even though it hurt. Now that the altar was built and after the fire was lit, he takes his boy, his son, And he places them on the altar and ties them up. And as we continue reading in verse uh, verse 10 there, it says, Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. Verse 11, But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Abraham looked up, and there in a thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. He goes up to the mountain, and he's called to kill his little boy. And I can just see when they're up there and Abraham places the altar in the wood and and he he ties his son up on this altar and I can just I can just see Isaac saying saying daddy what's going on? Is it's okay my son? But this this hurts daddy why do you have a knife like Why am I tied up? God will provide my son. I love you, my boy. I've always loved you. God is faithful. Oh, the pain of faith. The pain of faith. And as he takes the knife to slit the throat of his only son, God says, Abraham, Abraham, do not touch that boy. Do not kill your son because you have not withheld him from me. I will provide a substitute for him. God is faithful then. He's faithful now. And faith hurts. But Abraham is tested. He doesn't run from it doesn't hide from it. 
And God says, now I know that you truly fear God, that you truly respect me, that you, you truly love me, that you heed to my commands. He says, your faith is real, Abraham. Your faith is genuine. You trust me, says God. Is our faith like this? That even through the fiercest famines, the most painful plagues, the darkest days, can we see faith through famine? Can we see faith through the hardest times that God calls us to, trusting that if he's God, then he's got us in his hands? That if he says it, he's going to do it. Can we see the plan through our pain, man, the rescue mission, even through our misery, the preparation of faith, the pain of faith? And number three, you can write this down, the promise through faith. Preparation to faith, pain of faith, promise through faith. Through the pre preparation, through the pain, now Abraham sees the promise. Verse 13 says, Abraham looked up, and there in the thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. Abraham looked up and saw the provision of God. He looked up from what? From his pain. See, when you're hurting, where, where are your eyes? They're, they're on your pain. They're on your circumstance. You're, you're downcast. Your eyes are down. But see, friend, if, if we keep our eyes on our pain and on our brokenness, then we can't lift our eyes to see God's provision. Do you see this? Abraham looked up and saw God provided a substitute for his son so that he wouldn't have to sacrifice his only begotten son. What if when we're hurting, instead of looking at our pain, we look at our provision? And our provision, you say. The provision, the, the promise of life. A promise of a substitute sacrifice. Abraham looked up and saw that the, the Lord had provided a substitute to be sacrificed. And God had intended to sacrifice another so that Isaac could live. You know the first time love is mentioned? is in verse 2, and it's in the context of a father sacrificing his son. And in that same region of Moriah is a place called Golgotha. And Golgotha means the place of the skull. And another translation of, of Golgotha is a place of suffering or sacrifice. The Bible says in Luke twenty two thirty three 33, that Jesus was crucified at the place of the skull. He was killed at Golgotha. See, the same hill that Abraham almost sacrificed his only son, God indeed sacrificed his son so that we could live, friend. On the same mountain, on the same hill that, that Abraham almost sacrificed Isaac, God provided not a ram for the immediate sacrifice, but God provided the lamb, the Lord Jesus Christ, as the eternal sacrifice. As the eternal sacrifice sacrifice for us Jesus is the king of the hill the king of the hill once and for all forever finished to be killed as a substitute for us the king of the hill Jesus died and rose from the dead so that you could live through famine can come faith. You may be bruised, but you're not broken. You may have fallen, but you're not forgotten. You may have wandered, but you're not worthless. The king of the hill sees you right where you're at. And he simply says, come to me, all who are weary, all who are, who are heavy, all who, who, are, who are tired of living, how they're living. And I, Jesus says, will give you rest. The king of the hill who conquered death and sin is alive and he's here. 
And as we start this series, as we start off with this message, you need to know that everything points towards the Messiah, that it's all about Jesus. We never graduate past the gospel. It's always Jesus. It's always Jesus, and he, he's the king of the hill. No one can touch him. So as we close, I just want to ask anyone here tonight who's wandered away from God, who doesn't believe in God, who feels too far, who feels unlovable. I want to just ask that if that's you and you want to accept the king of the hill, you want to have your faith grown, if that's you where you feel like you have no faith and you feel empty and deserted and you feel like maybe my faith's broken, it's okay. It's okay to doubt. It's okay to wonder. But you need to know that God's real and he's here and he loves you and he's calling you back home. So if you just need more faith, if you need to come back home, if you need to be forgiven, we just raise your hand. We're, we're all family. I just want to pray for you. Yeah. You say, I need... I need God to just fill me. I need him to increase my faith. If that's you too, raise your hand. I want to pray for you guys. Yes. It's amazing. It's amazing. Friend, we're all in this together. I want to just pray. If we could all just, just go before the Lord together. You can raise your hands. You can stand. Whatever you feel led to. Let's pray for all of our friends that raise their hands to come home, to be forgiven, to accept life, to be filled with, with faith, to, to, be, to be okay with being tested so that our faith can be proven as genuine. Let's just pray together. We just want to say, God in heaven, thank you so much for tonight. Thank you that you are the king of the hill, that you have defeated death and sin forever that, that you are the official, the once and for all substitute for us, God. And I pray that as we go out, Lord, that all who have raised their hands with open hearts would just accept you. They'd receive you. They'd just say, God, I believe that you are God. I believe that you sent Jesus to die on a cross and to rise again so that I could be forgiven. And I turn from my sin and my past and I turn to you, Jesus. Please give me faith. Please give me purpose. Please give me power and wisdom and knowledge of your word. I don't know the answers, but I want to know you. I pray, God, for anyone in here that has received you tonight, God, for the first time or a second time or a third time, Father, that they would know that this decision is eternal, that this decision is it. And, God, I pray that we wouldn't wander from you, that we'd lean in and that you would test our faith. Thank you that you are the king of the hill. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Hey, real quick, we're going to close in a song. We're going to have some announcements, and then we're going to chill and kick it. But if, if you raised your hand, if you prayed that, we want to get you a Bible if you don't have one. We want to get to know you. We want to just pray for you. And so if you guys look around, you see kind of leaders just around. They're raising their hands. They got badges. Please, please, please go to a leader right now during this song and just say, hey, I accepted Jesus for the first time or I accepted him again what do I do or hey I just prayed for more faith can can you teach me what the Bible says about that we want to walk through life with you and you need to get plugged into a Spectrum Connect group you need to so we love you guys so much why don't we stand come up to the front as we close in this song worshiping Jesus the King of the Hill yeah.